Great, thank you very much. Um, so over the next 15 minutes, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is my personal experience of OCD, uh, so my personal story, and how this led me uh, to join forces with Naomi here and with others to set up Orchard OCD um, as really the first charity in the UK to focus exclusively on research into obsessive compulsive disorder. So the OCD journey really started for me in November 1990. So I was age 17. I was living in France. My parents are French. I was uh, studying for my scientific baccalaureate. And I was on the bus uh, coming home from school. And I can remember vividly suddenly having a, a what-if question enter my mind. Now, I won't tell you the specifics of the what-if because it is... I'm still very ashamed of it, actually, and you will find that shame is a very important, well, key characteristic of people with OCD. They're very ashamed of the thoughts that they have. But anyway, I'll give you examples, other examples, uh, from my support group of what OCD can be like. But I remember vividly that thought entering my mind, and five minutes later, it was still there. Ten minutes later, it was still there. I got home, the thought was still going round. That evening, I remember we went with my brothers and my dad to see a Total Recall, Arnold Schwarzenegger film, and throughout the film, I wasn't concentrating because I had these thoughts going round and round and round and round. Previous to that, I was a very happy uh, child and teenager, very good family, lovely parents, doing really well at school, uh, really into music and all that kind of stuff, good group of friends. You know, it was really going well, and I can remember distinctly those thoughts entering my mind, and they would not leave my mind for years after that. Um, after a few days, I got very worried. This was pre-internet days. Uh, we had a medical encyclopedia at home. I started going through it, trying to find some kind of answer to what was going on in my head. Um, I spoke to my parents about it. They were completely baffled, uh, but very supportive. And then what I did is I took the yellow pages and I found a, a psychologist, or at least a psychoanalyst, the first one I could find, who lived a few villages away, and uh, went to see her. And um, she didn't diagnose me with OCD. Instead of that, she took me on a year-long psychoanalytical journey into my uh, past, into my relationship with my parents, into my parents' relationship with their parents, into their relationship with their parents, all this Jungian kind of analysis and all that, which got me absolutely nowhere. And actually, I would say, probably made the matter worse. Okay. So then I went to university. I went to Oxford University, and what was really surprising was that the minute I arrived in Oxford, the OCD would disappear. And the second I would get on the coach, this was pre-Eurostars days, to go back to France, it would come back. And this lasted for years. And the OCD started to mushroom. I got what's called relationship OCD. Um, so I had a, a, a girlfriend that I stayed with for four years, and I would spend my time agonizing. Do I love her? Do I not love her? How can I know? And all that kind of stuff. I had all these different things, you know. And um, it got really out of hand. And then suddenly it subsided. You know, it just disappeared, and I was just like, you know, what has happened here? It was only about in my uh, mid to late 20s uh, when my brother lent me a book about OCD. This was probably in 97, 98, that I read that book, and I thought, oh, my God, that's exactly what I've had, you know. Um, in 2003, with the birth of my second child, uh, during my wife's pregnancy, it all came back basically. And then I knew what was happening. Within 24 hours, I knew this is my OCD, it's come back. I took myself to find a cognitive behavioral therapist, um, and she was really good, took me through a year of exposure response therapy, where we slowly exposed myself to my obsessive thoughts and all that, and it started to go again. And I have basically had OCD on and off for the past 30 years, you know. It comes for a year or two, it leaves for a year or two, it comes back, something triggers it. Uh, it might be, yes, like the birth of my son, or sometimes it's when I'm doing really well, you know, which is very surprising. Everything's going great, and suddenly the thoughts come, and I'm like, oh, no, here we go again. How long is this going to last? Um, Twelve years ago, it came with depression, and the depression amplifies the OCD. The OCD is bad, but with depression, I can tell you, it is ten times worse, you know. Uh, it was really bad, and that's when um, I was, um, I went to see my GP, who was really good, and she sent me to a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist is in the room, it's Sam Chamberlain, uh, who was wonderful, and who put me onto medications and all that kind of stuff, you know. And uh, things started to get better, and then six years ago, I had a really, really, really bad relapse. Um, I had to quit my job, um, you know, I was severely depressed, I wasn't sleeping, 
you know, just an absolute nightmare, suicidal and everything. And then uh, the psychiatrist I saw put me on a drug called clomipramine, which worked really well for the depression, but not for the OCD. Okay. And I saw uh, after that countless therapists and all that kind of stuff. And the thing that I found in the end that really worked, that took a year, was a therapy called eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And that worked really well for me. It took many, many, many uh, sessions and all that, and I got better and got worse and got better and got worse, but for the past two and a half years, I've actually been more or less symptom-free, which has been great, and I'm slowly coming off my meds, okay? So that's really the story of what I had with OCD. Now, six years ago, when things got really bad, my older brother said to me, Nick, you really need to do something, you know? You need to somehow find meaning in all this suffering, you know, because otherwise it just feels so pointless. You're stuck in your thoughts, you can't operate and all that kind of stuff. A little aside, as David said, um, I uh, run, uh, my day job is really running an organization called the AKU Society. So both my children have an ultra rare disease called Alcaptonuria. And exactly 12 years ago, I was giving a talk in this hall, uh, a TED talk actually, about my children's rare disease. And um, for the past 10 years, I've been working on that more or less full time. And we've raised uh, millions of pounds. We've developed a drug. We've taken it through phase two and phase three trials. It got approved by the European Medicines Agency two years ago. The children are on the drug. They're doing really well. And so my brother basically told me uh, six years ago, he said, you need to use the knowledge that you've developed in all this drug development and research and everything and try to apply it to OCD. You know, um, it's potentially a much more complex problem. AKU is a single gene defect, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, OCD is just so complicated, multifaceted and everything. So I was like, okay, all right. And he said, if you do it, I will help you and I'll provide you with some funding so that you can actually you know, live and all that and get it done. So the first thing I actually did uh, was Google and I came across Naomi and I emailed Naomi and she answered uh, within minutes and actually said, I'd be really interested to talk. You know, And so we did. And so we set up the charity originally called the OCD Research Partnership and we recruited some other trustees. Uh, we have a trustee from AstraZeneca, uh, Vincenzo Garcia, who was there from the start. Uh, we have Neil Barmer, who used to be at MQ, who has OCD himself. Uh, we have Sean Fletcher, who's a TV personality, who's, uh, whose son has got OCD. And we have also a scientific advisory board. We have Lynn, for instance, on the scientific advisory board and all that. And our focus is exclusively research into OCD. So I'll tell you some of the work um, that we've done. Our first study, uh, we raised funds for it two and a half years ago, um, is funding a study of psilocybin. So you've probably all heard of psychedelics, um, the effect that they can potentially have on mental health. So uh, Professor David Nutt from Imperial College is going to be launching this study uh, with Luca here um, in August. Um, so in just a few weeks' time, a feasibility study to really try and understand whether psilocybin can have any effect on OCD. And if it does, we will then be looking at raising further funds uh, to try and see whether we can take it further. So that's really exciting. We did a big crowdfunding campaign for that uh, two years ago to raise the funds, and we also got a fund from the Saracen Foundation uh, to help with that. Um, then in the middle of COVID, uh, we funded or part funded a study which Naomi Professor Feinberg did at the University of Hertfordshire on transcranial direct current stimulation, which is a small medical device uh, which provides a little imperceptible electric current through the scalp and uh, to see whether that actually had any feasibility as a potential study, uh, as a potential therapy there uh, for OCD. And that was successful. And we're now going to be raising funds for a larger study. So that was really exciting. Um, this year, we just finished two months ago our 2022 call for proposals. Uh, we've had many different applications from around the world, and our scientific advisory board is currently evaluating all of those. And in September, we should hear who is the winner, and we will provide £150,000 to actually really help set that up. So what we focus on is really um, non-commercial treatments, you know, treatments that otherwise would not be getting support. And anybody who's been involved in OCD knows how difficult it is to raise funds for this mental illness. You know, even though it is so common around one and a half to three percent of the population, it's so trivialized, you know. And um, when I tell people I've got OCD, I remember telling a good friend of mine um, a year or so ago, he was like, oh, you know, you must be really organized. And it's like, no, that's got nothing to do with it. It's not about just lining up your pencils and 
checking the door once or twice. It's a devastating mental disorder. I run an OCD support group in Cambridge where I live. We're affiliated to OCD Action, uh, the support group for people with OCD. Uh, and we meet once a month. And I can tell you the people, the friends and the members who join this uh, group, are, most of them are really, really suffering. You know, they are just... Um, overtaken by obsessive thoughts and as patients we tend to categorize our OCDs and the professionals don't do that because they say all OCD is the same but for us you know when we speak to each other well, what OCD do you have so for instance you'll have uh, pedophile OCD where people are just um, terrified that they might somehow be a pedophile or something when they're absolutely not, but they're terrified of it. You might get the kind of religious OCD where people are terrified if they're very religious that they might be thinking blasphemous thoughts. You know, you might get uh, the typical ones are people with just fears of germs. So one of our uh, members of our group, you know, has not left her home for 10 years because she is absolutely terrified of contamination, even though she knows that fundamentally this is just irrational. And I think that's what makes OCD just so tormenting, is that you know that your thoughts are irrational, but everything you do to stop them just makes it worse. And it's like you I remember seeing one therapist who say you're trying to dig yourself out of a hole. The more you dig, the worse it gets. And it's devastating. And one of my uh, best friends uh, took his own life uh, two and a half years ago. Um, he had uh, many different forms of OCD because OCD tends to morph. You know, for six months, you're obsessing about one thing. It might be germs. And then for six months, you're obsessing about another thing. It might be, you know, have I accidentally killed someone whilst driving my car? And for six months, you'll be thinking of something else and all that. And um, he had, um, he would tell me that, um, he would obsess about these kind of what he called false memories, you know, where he would be thinking, well, what if I did this awful thing? You know, how would I know? And he would go over and over and over. And the more he tried to figure it out, the worse it became and all that. And eventually, you know, after years of suffering from this, uh, he took his own life, which was absolutely devastating. You know, So that's why uh, we believe that research into OCD is just so important, you know. Um, so I'll, I'll finish off with maybe just um, a few things. Like we've worked very closely uh, with a, a consultancy in Cambridge called Costello Medical. They're absolutely brilliant, and every year they do some pro bono work. They actually have a pro bono department where a certain amount of the profit they make will go into helping charities for free, doing the most cutting edge and the most rigorous analysis. And they did what is called a cost of illness study. And it hasn't been published, but they've said that I can actually tell you um, some of the data that they found. And they've done that for us at Orchard OCD, and Naomi and myself were very involved uh, with them. And um, basically, what we wanted them to find out was how much is OCD costing the NHS and how much is it costing society? And the reason we want to know that is because, on average, for every single patient with OCD in the UK, 89 pence is spent on research every year. 89p, okay. And that is a statistic that comes from MQ, which is a relatively large uh, charity that funds uh, mental health research. 89p a year for every patient with OCD. That is nothing, okay. Can you imagine if that's what was spent on cancer or heart disease or anything? There would be an absolute outcry. So we wanted to find out how much is OCD costing society in the NHS? And this, these are some of the figures um, that they gave us. Okay. So they assume they've given us a really complicated spreadsheet and we can actually um, put in certain data and it will tell us the results. So generally prevalence of OCD is anywhere between 1% and 2.5-3% depending on which studies you look at. So if we assume 1.6% of the population is OCD, which is actually quite a sizable amount of people. I don't know how many people in the UK, six and a half million. Okay, that means around a million people have got OCD. You know, that's quite a lot. The annual cost to the NHS is of 378 million pounds. If on top of that you add the cost of depression for the 60% of these people of OCD, you're just short of a billion pounds that is costing the NHS, around 900 million pounds. That's around 1,200 pounds per patient. Okay. The annual cost of OCD to society, and that's when you take into account lost productivity, unemployment benefits, uh, cost of private therapy and all that, is 5 
billion pounds okay, to society. That means that the annual cost of an OCD patient in the UK to society is £7,000. Okay? Now, if you include what we call indirect costs, and that is the cost of family members. <clears throat> so I see that all the time. I, when we had our last OCD support group, I was speaking to a mother of a 26-year-old who has OCD. He spends 16 hours a day sitting on his sofa, consumed by his OCD. She can't work because she has to look after him and all that. When you take all that together, the cost of carers and everything, it's nearly 11 billion pounds that it is costing society. So that's 15,000 pounds per patient. So could you imagine, 89p is spent on research a year and it's costing 15,000 pounds per patient to society, you know? If we could develop better treatments and all that kind of stuff, the, the reduction in just the financial cost of society would be significant. And that's without even looking at just the mental suffering and all those kinds of things that it's causing. So that's why uh, we've set up Orchard OCD. That's why we're really trying to make a big difference for that. And what's very encouraging is I think things are really starting to move around the world. Um, in the States, there's this new foundation for OCD research that's been set up by some very, very wealthy philanthropists. Um, there's a number of patient groups, OCD Action, OCD UK, the International OCD Foundation, uh, some in France, all around the world. And we're increasingly seeing, I think, the, 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 the progress in new neuroscience and research that's starting to make a difference. So thank you very much.